the distinction between cyber, the Cybercrime Act and uh, the Domestic Violence Act is Domestic Violence Act gives protection orders. It gives agency to, to people um, who are um, victims and they can get a protection order and they're not reliant on the police investigating and the uh, prosecutor prosecuting. They, they've got agency. They can do something. And so uh, I'll just respond briefly on the definitions and then hand over to my colleague. Uh, so as we understand the current Domestic Violence Act and its amendment, both of these have a long list of things which are not physical violence, but which are defined as violence. Our suggestion is that our um, additional definitions could fit into um, that either directly into the definition of violence. So for example, the malicious sharing of, of these intimate images the definition of intimate images we actually took more or less directly from the cybercrime bill. Um, or it could they, they could nest in one of the subcategories. So for example, the malicious sharing of images could also be regarded as, as sexual violence, or it could just be directly in in, in, in in the definition of violence, the scheme of the act. If if Honorable Horn thinks that the that the the master category shouldn't be violence or but it should rather be abuse, then I think that's a debate within the committee. Um, but, but we think that our definitions should fit within whatever master category um, is uh, is finally included in the Domestic Violence Act. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, respond to your question. The scheme of the act. Could we think that um, thank you so much, Andrew. And noting the time that we've been told that we're quite limited, I do want to respond quickly to what was pointed out by Honorable Dianti, that um, I'm, I was using the terms former and present, but that is more kind of in context and example, but that does not mean that is exactly what happens in those situations. So my apologies if I might have led the committee astray. But I also want to come back to the point around, I that I commend the committee for wanting to have the statistics and numbers in trying to understand um, the extent of online gender-based domestic, domestic violence. But I want to come back to the understanding that the report of domestic violence in context is a difficult issue because of the kind of systems that we have in place. This then impacts on the kind of evidence that we have to trying to understand the extent of domestic violence in general that we kind of whether we've existed with for a very long time and online domestic violence. And then this comes to the point of the slide in slide nine, the study that has been called quoted was actually commissioned as a very urban high level study trying to understand the levels of indicativeness of online gender-based violence. And although a statistical methodology was taken in getting the numbers, what was realized in this research, we will, which we will share with the um, committee as well, was that the nuance of the issues, which also ra raises the question of people being actually able to identify these issues, made it difficult for people to actually tick a form to say, yes, I've experienced it. But when you engage in qualitative research and actually then decide to unpack what is your experience online, these are when these issues do come up. And this is the point that we are putting forward to the portfolio <coughs> committee that as collection is being done on domestic violence, there is an opportunity for there to be disaggregated data at the extent to which as one is experiencing this domestic violence, what extent was tech part of this system? Because if we have the kind of data disaggregated at those different intersectionalities that we mentioned of gender, race, or sexuality, we would then be able to say, this is the extent of the challenge that's involved. And we also would then strongly encourage for there to be more investment in actually working with civil society, as we pointed out in a governance model, and institutions such as Research ICT Africa in being able to document this work, and also working with existing organizations on domestic violence, because the sensitivity of this issue means that it cannot just be about numbers, but really about taking a preemptive role of how do we ensure that our, um, where people, our authorities are trained well enough to understand that as this abuse or violence has happened, this is the platform in which it took place. And it is not just an abstract harm that we then said, because it happened on a particular platform, it doesn't count. So that is the point that we're trying to advocate for in our submission. And we look forward to presenting more material that the committee can engage with and also 
work with us in this trying to understand of how do we how do we ensure that South Africa becomes a lead in ensuring online tech assisted violence is included within the ambit of domestic violence. And with that, I conclude and thank you very much for your time and listening to our submissions. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Research, research ICT Africa. Um, you were within your time. You are still left with two minutes. Uh, thank you very much for respecting the time and for the content you've given us. Uh, all the submissions will be taken into consideration when we deliberate on the bill. We will now invite rape crisis. Good morning, Chairperson. Good morning, committee members um, and members from the public who are attending. I uh, just want to see if I have um, permission to share my screen. Doesn't seem that way. Um, maybe the hosts can just give me permission for sharing. Are the hosts able to give me permission to share my screen? Uh, yes, they are busy doing that. Uh, you can start uh, with your introductions. Uh, I think the committee secretary will be working with your organization to upload and flight the slides. Uh, but Thank you. Hmm? Thank you, Chairperson. I did send my uh, I did send my presentation to the to the secretary. Uh, so um, we doing presentations on the criminal matters amendment um, and criminal matters and related uh, matters amendment bill. Um, this is a joint submission by Rape Crisis, Lawyers for Human Rights, and Judges Matters campaign. Uh, the, um, I'm joined by a colleague from Lawyers for Human Rights who is in the gallery, uh, so she's available um, if there are any questions. So firstly, um, the Constitution in Section 34 provides that everyone has a right to have um, any dispute be resolved by the application of the law um, and for this to be decided in a fair public hearing before a court uh, where another independent and impartial mm -hmm. tribunal or forum. And the Criminal Procedure Act uh, of 1977 then aims to set out the criminal justice procedures to be followed in order to give effect to section 34 of the constitution. The purpose of the amendment bill before the committee um, today of, of one of the bills uh, is threefold. Firstly, is to make it more difficult for persons accused of crime um, involving sexual and gender-based violence and femicide to get bail. Apology. Secondly, my apology, Chair. Can we just get an indication, Chair? Was I would like to follow the presentation, and it's quite no. difficult. Okay, the it comes now. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, uh, can you proceed, um, Ms. Wittstein? Sure. Uh, so, um, firstly, the, the purpose of this amendment bill is to make it more difficult for persons accused of crimes involving sexual and gender-based violence and femicide to get bail. Secondly, to make it more difficult for such persons uh, to get parole. And thirdly, to make minimum sentences for crimes involving sexual and gender-based violence um, and femicide harsher than what they are now. 
And um, while we do not have uh, concerns with the first two, um, the first two statements regarding the purpose, uh, we do have a serious question to ask about the minimum sentencing um, and the increase, the increasing of minimum sentences. And the central question really is, will the proposed amendment contribute meaningfully that survivors um, have uh, better access to justice? And does it contribute meaningfully to the purpose of, um, of this bill? and its overarching goal of increasing access to justice. And I think that is a question to ask of, um, of, of all of the bills in, uh, in question, although we are dealing uh, with this bill um, exclusively. And our submission is that increasing already high minimum sentences won't contribute meaningfully to access to justice, for the greatest possible number of sexual and gender-based violence and femicide survivors and their loved ones. And in fact, uh, these proposed amendments might just be, um, might just be pieces of feel-good amendments uh, to contribute to us having a sense of, of wellness if we think about harsh sentences. But, um, we argue that this actually does not improve survivors access to justice and it doesn't improve uh, the general public and communities access to justice and therefore it doesn't uh, it doesn't fit with the purpose of the bill so why shouldn't we increase minimum sentences so there's no credible evidence that harsher minimum sentences deter crimes including sexual offences. And then very shockingly, minimum sentences only have an impact on less than 9% of reported matters. So only cases where a guilty verdict is reached um, are cases where uh, minimum sentencing provisions will have an impact. And uh, the most comprehensive and recent study on this was done by the South African Medical Research Council they looked at 4,000 um, reported, nearly 4,000 reported cases at police stations. And of those, only 8.6% had a guilty verdict. So minimum sentencing legislation would only apply to 8.6% um, of those 4,000 cases. And um, uh, that means that uh, more 91. percent 4% of survivors uh, will not be affected by the minimum sentencing legislation. And the minimum sentencing legislation will have no, um, no uh, positive impact on them or give them an increased sense um, of justice. Um, so in order to truly ensure that the maximum number of victims of sexual and gender-based violence and femicide and their loved ones have access to justice, the focus should be on what happens before conviction and not after. So the current situation, um, and this, this might be, um, uh, hopefully it is a shocking picture, is that over the past six years, so I had a look at the, uh, the official NPA annual reports from 2014, 2015 financial year, to the 2019-2020 financial year showed that the number of cases finalized with a verdict, uh, that is the, um, that is, sorry, that's the, the column second from the left, have, have decreased quite severely over the past, um, past six years by almost 2,000 cases. So cases finalized with a verdict uh, is defined by the NPA as ca cases who ha which has a verdict of any kind. So um, a guilty verdict, a not guilty verdict, an acquittal, whatever. Uh, so the number of cases has actually decreased significantly over the past six years. If you then look to the far right column, you'll see that the number of actual convictions has decreased 
by 1,000 uh, over the past six years. And to those, um, those numbers represent people who have been, uh, who have been raped, people who have been sexually assaulted. And the number of those people who receive justice, we can see yearly um, getting less and less. However, the conviction rate, which is often, um, which is often the number that is, that is um, printed on the billboards, have increased. But that is merely because less and less cases were prosecuted. So the conviction rate is calculated by taking the number of convictions, dividing it by the number of cases finalized with a verdict, and then multiplying it by 100. And then you will get uh, the conviction rate. So what this, uh, what this slide shows us is that the number of cases finalized with a verdict has been decreasing almost yearly with the shocking number. The number of actual convictions has decreased almost yearly. So fewer and fewer survivors have a sense of justice and fewer and fewer criminals are being prosecuted. Um, and then I just, re, uh, I just included uh, how the conviction rate is calculated. Um, and I think this, this picture is quite dire. Um, I don't think it's the first time that the committee sees this. Uh, I know that, uh, that um, it has been discussed in previous meetings, but I think it specifically bears importance when we look at, um, at, at the current amendments. And if we think about minimum sentencing, will minimum sentencing um, really uh, have an impact that, that we think it would if we look at uh, the current position? So our submission is that we should actually, as a country, focus on increasing the number of convictions. And the reason why is because this will provide more survivors of SGBVF and their families a sense of justice. But also, it is a greater deterrent to crime if there is a greater chance that the crime will be prosecuted. Because that then actually um, sends a message to criminals that there is a chance that you will have to account in court for your crime. Um, so increasing the number of convictions and increasing the number of prosecutions uh, really um, will, will further demonstrate our commitment to a victim-centric criminal justice system, and it will actually contribute to deterring crime. And then the question obviously is how do we do that? The first thing that must be done is focusing on the attrition in the criminal justice system. And attrition happens at various stages. Um, it happens at when the police, uh, at the police station, uh, when, um, when uh, the charge officer uh, uh, um, deters the victim from opening a case. It happens when um, accused persons can't be can't be traced or can't be found. It happens when the prosecution decides that there is no um, reasonable uh, prospect, um, prospect for a guilty conviction. And it happens when, um, when witnesses later withdraw. So there are many points of attrition and, um, and we're very aware of that. But we have to focus on that if we want to see increased, um, increased convictions. And then we also have to focus on increased prosecutions. So how do we get more prosecutions? How do we achieve that? The prosecution of sexual offenses takes place within a framework um, of legislation and directives. And firstly, and this has been discussed in this committee before, prosecutors are measured on their conviction rates. So prosecutors aren't measured on the number of convictions that they achieve, or on the number of cases that they prosecute, but on what is their conviction rates. And then secondly, prosecutors may only prosecute matters where there's a reasonable prospect of a successful guilty verdict um, or conviction. So uh, if we want to achieve more prosecutions, we must address both of those things. We must set different performance um, measurement indicators for prosecutors but we must also ensure that more cases 
can reasonably result in conviction. We must achieve stronger cases. We must achieve cases that prosecutors can take forward um, and prosecute. And we recommend that um, that one of the ways to do this is to establish sexual um, establish specialized forensic units across the country. Sexual offenses are notoriously difficult to prosecute. I don't have to tell the committee that. Um, we know that we hear that from the NPA often. Um, but it has been shown that cases where the victim accessed such a unit, a specialized forensic unit, had a better chance of conviction than cases that just went through the general criminal justice system. So sexual, specialized forensic units must be established and must be accessible to all victims of sexual offenses, because that is one of the best ways to ensure that the sexual offenses cases that are reported um, can be prosecuted um, and will result in a, in, a, um, in a reasonable prospect of a successful conviction. And then obviously um, making sure that, that more survivors have a sense of justice and have access to justice, which will also restore the faith um, in the criminal justice system uh, that communities so often lack. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, this uh, presentation, we will continue to use it even beyond uh, these public hearings as part of our oversight um, um, over the NPA. And I think generally this public hearings is not only about the bills, but is also how to strengthen oversight over the criminal justice system to ensure that there is effective implementation of the bill uh, or of the acts once they are approved. So we are very grateful to, to the presentation and the Thank issue. You. Uh, honorable members, I've noted the following members who would ask questions. Honorable Mufuken, Honorable Jale, Honorable Horn, um, Honorable Janji, Honorable Nivod Prakhans. Um, those are the members that have indicated that they want to ask questions. Let's start with Honorable Mufuke. Thank you very much, Chairperson, and thanks for the presentation uh, on the rape crisis. Uh, I just want to ask a question that you are saying that you advocate for harsher sentences, which one of them, but I didn't hear you talking about the uh, parole, whether once people are maybe on schedule five or six, what are you saying about parole? And then I agree with you on the issue of the established uh, specialized forensic unit because most of the cases failed because of, a, a, you know, if you don't have any a, a forensic uh, people uh, helping in that. But I also want to check on the issue of the rape kits that are available. Are you happy with them as they are in the police stations? And uh, what is it that you say that they will be a better option? Because I know you know the process, but are you happy with that rape kit that are available at the moment? Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Mufuke, Honorable Noma Temba, Masego Jail. Thank you, Chair. And also thank you to the presenter, the rape crisis. I only have, in fact, I agree with you, Chair. This uh, presentation uh, assists us more on the issues also of implementation uh, after the whole. Uh, 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 after we have we have uh, passed the bill, yes. Uh, my 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 question is just uh, that, Chairperson. I just want to find out. Uh, I hear the presenter says uh, they would love to have the uh, uh, have it difficult to get bail and also get parole. Do you have any suggestions? Maybe that you can share with us. Maybe I I didn't get that. But uh, do you have any suggestion as to how difficult do you think uh, that can be done? Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Hon. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, and, and I agree with you. This is obviously help, helpful to the committee in reminding us of the bigger picture in respect of the way uh, we deal as a country with, with sexual violence specifically. Um, I just want to maybe get a comment from, from rape crisis um, as to whether they would agree that the proposed uh, uh, um, legislative amendment they ultimately included in their uh, a presentation talking to specialized uh, forensic units, uh, whether they are of the view that it would be uh, something that we must consider, including in the trio of bills we, we're dealing with now, and whether the setting up of such specialized forensic units are, are really something that is a policy decision that must be driven on a policy level with the Minister of Police and or the, the broader security cluster. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Janche. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you to, to Rape Crisis, lawyers uh, for human rights and judges matter, because they, there's a nice caucus there of those three organizations. Uh, thank you, and uh, can, you can see the, the presentation. Chair, mine is only a comment, because I think what we're hearing here, uh, Rape Crisis and team are saying, and they put that issue of saying to us, they don't really think that a harsher sentence is, is what we need, uh, if I get them correctly. They make that, that point very clear. Uh, and they give even stats in relation to those things. Uh, the 9% the, 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 the impact, uh, the poor guilt verdict, in turn, which is 8%. And so I think this, they seem to be saying uh, we need to be, yes, let's do the law, but uh, I think there's something that we need to do beyond the law. It's the issue that happens before and not necessarily uh, on the aftermath. And with that, Chair, it reminds because the slide they, they showed of a decline uh, in, in, in convictions or prosecutions when you remember in February, in, in a session you, you convened with this entire team of the portfolio committee, there were many shocks in that meeting. One of the shocks was the decline in the prosecution. In February 2019, uh, I mean, uh, 2020, this before the COVID. Uh, and, and so we, we had a sense about this ourselves. I really want to welcome, as you say, Chair, and I know they are going to be with us post to this because we had a justice department two weeks ago, you know we're not happy uh, with the kind of performance of that. And yesterday we're talking about the functionality of, of, of the justice system. I think this presentation speaks to that issue, that you don't have one magic wand to deal uh, with this issue of GBV or domestic violence. It is a whole of society kind of an approach and I, I'm more interested, in addition to the forensic unit, but I'm more interested on the last point they raised here, which is our task, uh, was they spoke of the nature, you've always raised this issue, the nature of the performance target, the quality, the impact of this performance target. And I think that, that that's homework for us uh, uh, into the future. And so I, I'm, I'm really happy with this. Uh, if you have one or two things that you can put in the egg, but it speaks to the leadership role, uh, both in the administration, at the political level, in the oversight role of this committee, as well as the social compact with such organizations as, as rape crisis. Because that's how you're going to defeat this pandemic. It's not just a, a, a law that you can pass and then every, I, I don't want to repeat what I said yesterday, that you have a law, you have a conviction, more same thing happens. You have a, a woman raped, you have a woman murdered, you have a woman bent, you have a woman dumped. Similar modus operandi by all of these kind of men. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Nivo Trachens. 
Um, thank you very much, Chair. And thank you to Rape Crisis for that presentation. And so I see the numbers that you have given us today. 355 out of 855,923. Three, I don't know if the figures are correct, of the of the of the um, cases that had the opportunity to go to court, but I don't don't see through or don't go through the court process. Um, and a lot of people often say, I want to have my day in court, I want to see my time in court. So the victim's opportunity to speak out in court is is not given. They don't receive that because the prosecutor takes that decision that uh, a conviction, not going to get a conviction, not going to get a win. So it's the prosecutors who are denying the victim that opportunity to have their day in court. And it's the prosecutors who are the, the, the obstacle. And so what do we do with that? What do we do after that? Because the victim remains the victim. They remain with the suffering. Um, the perpetrator can view this and say, well, I can just continue with my crimes because these kind of cases will never see a courtroom. And uh, then the number of abusers just keeps increasing and the number of victims also keeps increasing. Um, and that is the pandemic. That is where, that's the situation that we are in. So what happens after that kind of situation? So I'd like to, you know, give my congratulations to a TC, to the TCC process. I did visit um, the Tutuzela Care Center myself, um, but we don't have enough of these kind of centers. Every police station does not have a TCC at attached to it. Yes, there are family services there. Um, but, you know, in these kind of situations where a TCC is not attached, a police officer can give, you know, make that decision that, um, you know, this case is not worth the reporting. So, so I would think that if a victim reports a case, they should directly go to the TCC center where all the services are there, evidence can be collected, et cetera, and then the case can go through. And the NPA is in the Tutuzela Care Center. You know, so instead of the police, you know, maybe that member, that police member is tired that day and they're just like, oh, you know, it's just a domestic fight, you and your husband, just you can go home, you'll sort it out. Uh, but so if a person comes to the police station um, and then their case gets dropped, um, do, you know, is there a record of that? Perhaps there are a number of case numbers that are, you know, that have not been investigated or taken further that we don't know about because the, you know, the case just gets dropped. And then in terms of withdrawal of the withdrawal of a case, if there's evidence there, everything that is necessary uh, for the case to go through, but because of family pressure or any other kind of pressure, the victim then decides to withdraw the case. Is there, in that case, is there any kind of measure that the case can continue despite the victim's withdrawal? There has to be a way, perhaps an audiovisual, excuse me, of audiovisual um, court hearing. Is, you know, is that something that can be considered in your view? Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Glenis Pretenbach. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning to everybody. Um, I just want to make a comment um, as a result of uh, the input of um, Honorable Niva Drachen. Um, generally, prosecutors are very sensitive uh, to the situation surrounding uh, particularly gender-based violence. And if they don't place a case on the roll because they don't believe it will be, there's no prospect of a successful prosecution, um, they consider very carefully the impact, both emotionally and psychologically, on all the players in that scenario, including more particularly the 
the complainant. But a court case, particularly a court case surrounding gender-based violence is particularly harrowing for the victim. Um, the complainant is uh, really put through uh, the grinder in a, in a gender-based violence case, and more particularly in a rape case. So the, the, the court experience is deeply unpleasant. Uh, despite all the technological advances, it's still deeply unpleasant. Um, you have to discuss the most intimate of details. You have to submit to uh, very, very rigorous, often very, very rude cross-examination. And um, so, so it's not a pleasant experience. If there is no prospect of a successful prosecution, it would be seriously wrong for a prosecutor to place the matter on the roll, allow the complainant to be put through that deeply unpleasant experience when they know from the outset they can't win. Um, there are other methods of dealing with the matter. There are, uh, there are um, services available to the complainant to try and deal with the fallout, both of the case not being placed on the roll and of the results of of the assault or rape complained of, but it would be very irresponsible of a prosecutor to put a matter on the roll simply to give the complainant her day in court with a full knowledge that uh, the prosecution could not be successful. Um, so, so just that to consider. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, and we need also to consider the whole value chain, how the matter was investigated by the investigating officers up to the level where the prosecutors must make a decision whether to prosecute or not to prosecute. So I think what this calls upon on all of us is to ensure that we improve the entire criminal justice system. Um, over to your rape crisis. Thank you. Thank you, um, Honourable Chair, and thank you, uh, members, for your um, very engaging questions. I think I'll, I'll start with um, Honourable Brayton Buff's question and then um, move backwards. So, um, I mean, we are, com we are obviously um, very sensitive and aware uh, that we, uh, and that the prosecution does not want to put um, complainants through that hurrying process if there is no prospect of success. Um, and I think that the, the um, legislative framework and the directives are very clear that prosecutors um, may, only pros uh, may only prosecute cases where there is that prospect. So our quest really is um, how do we make sure that there are more um, cases that have a reasonable prospect of success? And, um, and that's, why we, uh, that's why we proposed um, that more forensic units be established across the country. And now I'll get to um, Honorable Miva Dachan's questions um, and comments, which really, uh, which really illustrates that um, that it it is a, often a much better outcome for victims who choose to first report to a TCC um, and then receive that level of support, and only um, at a later stage the police is called in uh, for the charges. And I think there's a reason why this is a best practice model internationally. Our concern is that there are only 55 such centers across the country. Uh, there, there isn't one in every corner um, uh, of every province of the country. And um, it might be, like um, Honorable Horn mentioned, it might be a policy decision, but I think that, there, um, that the Department of Justice and the NPA has um, time and time uh, again, really illustrated the commitment to establishing specialized forensic units. And I think it really is about how do we go about creatively to make sure that more survivors have access to that level of support, that more survivors have access um, to that level of, um, of having the, the evidence collected in a responsible and sensitive manner and making sure that there are more reason, more cases presented to the NPA that have a reasonable prospect of success. Um, and I think that, um, that it often is about the, the value chain of the criminal justice system, but how do we make each part stronger? And the reason why we raised this um, at this point uh, in the submission process of these three bills 
is that we have to be extremely careful as a country not to be lulled into a false sense of safety by um, by having our lawmakers and our Department of Justice and our government tell us that we have these wonderful laws, that we have stricter and stricter minimum sentences. Um, but when we do the math, we find out that that actually has very little impact on what happens to most survivors in sexual offences matters. Um, and I think that, uh, I hope that answers Honor Honourable Horn's question. Um, the, the, policy, the policy issue really is about how do we think um, creatively to establish more uh, specialized forensic units so that every survivor has access. But I think the role of this committee is to really ensure that um, the, the accountability um, is, is practiced and that the Department of Justice and all of the various role players are held accountable for making those policy decisions. And um, I think that's the, the same argument for the um, performance targets of the prosecutors. It's a conversation that has been had in this committee many times, um, but has, has the changes been made? Um, and I think you'll find the answer is no. So really, how does this committee exercise its oversight role? Um, whether or not it's a, it's a policy decision or, or a legislative decision, I don't think we can legislate specialized forensic units at this moment. But um, how does the, the Department of Justice and the NPA do their day-to-day -day work? And how does that ultimately protect um, victims and survivors of, um, of sexual offenses and gender-based violence and femicide? Um, and uh, yeah, I think I answered um, Honorable Ajanchi's uh, comments with that as well. Um, I want to I want to just comment on a uh, last point raised by Honorable Liva Drachen, which is about uh, if a complainant withdraws from a criminal matter um, at some point, can the matter go forward without them? And um, that is that depends on the other evidence available. If there's enough evidence available to still um, have the case. Uh, a pr prospect that the case will result in a successful conviction, then the case can go forward. But often that complainant is the only witness for the state. Um, and then uh, often the, the prospect isn't there anymore. I'm going to give over to my colleague, Sonia Bornman from Lawyers for Human Rights to address the issues of bail and parole and the rape kits raised by Honorable Mufu King and Honorable J. Good morning, Chairperson um, and Honourable Committee members. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. I'm just briefly going to, uh, to address those questions as Ms. Gordenstein has indicated. So when it comes to the issues of parole and bail um, as provided for in this draft bill, we do not have any difficulty with these provisions that will essentially make it more difficult for uh, alleged perpetrators of these kinds of crimes involving gender-based violence, sexual violence and femicide, both to get parole and to get bail. We are comfortable that uh, in the current climate, making it harder to get parole, making it harder to get bail for these alleged perpetrators um, is appropriate and suitable. Um, our concern, as Ms. Gordonstein has pointed out, is with the, the question of minimum sentencing because our problem is not with sentencing in South Africa. We already have fairly harsh minimum sentences in place. Our problem is with the investigation, the building of a strong docket, and the successful prosecution um, of these crimes. And this is, um, as, as Honorable Breitenbach has pointed out, uh, if a prosecutor does not have a strong docket in front of them, then it becomes increasingly difficult to, to prosecute a case. And that is where we feel the energy and the emphasis needs to be. On the question of, of rape kits, 
Um, unfortunately, we find very often that there are not enough rape kits uh, where rape kits need to be. And another issue of concern is the chain of evidence. So what happens to those rape kits? How they are transported? Do they get to where they need to be? And how long does it take uh, to process those rape kits? And, and, and we think that this contributes then also ultimately to the strength of a docket um, and whether a case has reasonable prospects of success uh, for prosecution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is that all, That's all from us, uh, Honorable Chair. I think we, uh, we really also got the message about the time. Uh, so I see we, um, we made it in time. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, and I hope you said everything you wanted to say. Uh, you have not miss, missed anything. Thank you. I think we are covered. We also did start two minutes early uh, because the previous uh, the previous um, presenters finished a bit early. So uh, we definitely had our time. Thank you very much. And thank you to the committee for asking such pointed questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Now we will uh, invite South African Institute for Advanced Constitutional, uh, Public Human Rights and International Law. You have 20 minutes. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I am Dr. Ms. Paru. I'm the head of the um, Sexual and Gender-Based Violence Unit at SIFAC with our very long name that you just um, read out. We're a research center connected with the University of Johannesburg. It will be both myself and one of our researchers, uh, Ms. Rupa Fatsul Maposa, that will be making submissions. If I may ask if I can also share my screen throughout our presentation, it will, because um, uh, Ms. Maposa will also be using the same uh, presentation. Is that possible? That will be appreciated. Okay, thank you. I see I'm disabled to do screen sharing. Uh, can, can the committee secretariat assist? But in the meantime, you can start with your introductions. Okay. Uh, firstly, I would just like to uh, thank the um, entire um, drafting committee, whoever has been um, paying attention to amending our uh, gender-based violence um, legislation. Um, for me, for us at SIFAC, it is definitely a show of the seriousness with which um, our government is viewing gender-based violence. So that is absolutely welcomed by us. We are encouraged by this. And um, uh, yeah, I just want to start with that. Let me just see, I see I have been uh, made, uh, let me just see, I can't see if I, it seems like my sharing is not working for some reason. Um, Never the, uh, I'm not sure, let, can I just please, if you can just give me a couple of seconds to try and see if I can um, do so. Um, okay, it seems like it's not working. Um, maybe, in any event, then maybe, just, what, maybe what we can do, maybe what we can do, I, don't take note of the fact that we have been sitting here for some time and okay. some members would want to have comfort break. Uh, can we have comfort break until uh, 11.25? Hopefully uh, by that time, um, everything would be fine on your sides and the committee secretariat would assist you. So it's a three minutes break, uh, two minutes in fact, uh, so that we can just stretch our legs. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'd be very happy with that. Thank you, Chair. 
teachers and help boys. Just, just take care of those dogs in the meantime for a few minutes. I apologize. Did you hear them? Leave the dogs alone. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, um, hello, ma'am. You are a co-host. You may share the screen now. Ah, I see. Can you there see? There you go. Can you yes, see it now? Yes. Hip. Wonderful. 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 So you can right. see my first slide there, parliamentary submission. Yes, that's very clear, though. Okay. I can okay, also share it with afterwards if you need um if I you can, can meanwhile send it so that we can just quickly send it to members as well those who would want to have it you can just quickly send it to mr Ramang, then we'll share okay. it with members just now while we're having a break we're taking a break thanks man thanks, thanks. Thank you very much. I think we can start. The thing is now. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, we will be in our submission, we will be talking about all three of the bills, only certain points that we want to raise in terms of suggested um, amendments that will be made to the uh, pieces of legislation that these bills relate to. Firstly, on I will be making a presentation on the Domestic Violence Amendment Bill, as well as the Criminal and Related Matters Amendment Act. And then Rupa Fatsu Mapaso will be, Maposa will be making a presentation on the Criminal Law, Sexual Offences and Related Matters Amendment Act. So the first point that um, on the Domestic Violence Amendment Bill that we want to um, speak about are the additional and amendment amended definitions. So there are certain ones that we welcome in general. One I'm going to spend a little bit of time on. Um, firstly, controlling behavior, coercive behavior, disability, elder abuse, harm, sexual harassment, all these additional and amend, amended definitions are very warmly welcomed, and uh, we deeply encourage you uh, to keep it in the um, or to keep the suggested amended amendments in the um, Domestic Violence Act. Then I would like to say something about spiritual abuse. And the first, um, I wanted to say something, but then I realized I will have my, my time now. Um, so I thought, let me say something a little bit more. In our uh, written submission, we um, said very little about spiritual abuse, uh, particularly because we just assumed that everyone would be on the same page, that that is something that is extremely important uh, to be included under domestic violence. What I didn't hear, maybe I missed it, um, but most of the people that were speaking, um, honorable members, as well as uh, freedom of religion, were focusing on the type of domestic violence that takes place within an institution, whether it is a church, a synagogue, whatever type of religious institution there may be. But please let us not forget we are talking about domestic violence. So this is really, for me, my interpretation, spiritual abuse within the domestic sphere in the home environment. And it is whether you can interpret spiritual abuse to form part of emotional abuse, form part of um, 
uh, psychological abuse, even um, economic abuse, it is of extreme importance to include and to, ex um, to include spiritual abuse under domestic violence. It must be part of the new uh, legislation. So I want to plead with um, parliamentarians who are um, our legislature that is busy drafting these legislation, please keep it in. You must place special emphasis on it in addition to the other forms of domestic violence that there is. So even though I didn't um, add it very specifically or place specific focus on it, I agree with each and every one of you that um, gave freedom of religion a little bit of a hard time in um, criticizing them for wanting to take it out. What we do find problematic with the additional and amended definitions is that the suggestion is made to remove stalking from the list of definitions. Uh, we do feel that stalking must uh, be part, still stay part of domestic violence, that it must not be removed, but please um, to keep it in the um, Domestic Violence, violence um, um, Act eventually. Then I want to move forward to the public reporting duty. In general, this is welcomed that the public now has a reporting duty. Um, I'll come to the, the issues that we also have with it. What we want to suggest also is that women are added as a vulnerable group, specifically because the reality is that women and children, children are already um, included as a vulnerable group of persons, but that women are also included. The reason for this is to make it in line with the suggested amendment in the Criminal Law, Sexual Offences and Related Matters Amendment Act Amendment Bill, particularly because um, this will complement mm -hmm. uh, um, in this, um, the former uh, amendment bill, you include women as vulnerable persons, but in the domestic violence amendment bill, women aren't included as a vulnerable group. Uh, group. What we are concerned about, and we also don't pay enough attention to it in our written submission, is um, that it might open up certain issues that's already existing with the reporting of sexual and gender-based violence as well as domestic violence is that very often our South African police services response is not as it is as it is supposed to be, as it, it would be ideal um, in, in as much as believing um, a victim, a primary victim to go, uh, reach out to the South African police service. Now there is an additional duty that is placed on the public to um, report. So this might complicate matters um, and reinforce certain societal beliefs around domestic violence. Can you all still hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you. Our next point um, to stay with our, our uh, points that we are making on the South African Police Service, the responsibility of our SAPS. In general, it is welcomed, um, specifically around the disciplinary action, which is already in the existing Domestic Violence Act that there are certain disciplinary action that can be taken. What we are concerned about is the implementation thereof. So there's this duty that's placed on the South African Police Service and also to take disciplinary action against members of the South African Police Service that are not complying with their duties. So we would encourage the proper implementation here of. Um, so very importantly here, um, is that what is existing in our legislation already and the Domestic Violence Act, that this is reinforced, that it must, the implementation must be improved upon. And then what we would, our um, suggestion is that the, for uh, the Commission for Gender Equality, for example, as an independent uh, chapter uh, chapter 9 institution of our constitution that they are given an, a type of oversight role so that the SAPS is also held accountable um, from that um, point of view. Then also, and this is throughout every single one of our um, submissions that we make, is that it's extremely important 
that there must be education. There must be um, of everyone, all the role players. So society at large, I will come to that also again, back to that. But I think especially with our South African police service, there must be more training, especially in sensitivity to the type of violence that we are dealing with here, gender-based violence, domestic violence, sexual violence. So this will also be very much a training and awareness um, and an education role that can be played, played by civil society. Someone has mentioned this earlier, the role of civil society can also be accentuated a little bit more. So that is what I wanted to say on the Domestic Violence Amendment Bill. Next, I want to move to the Criminal and Related Matters Amendment Bill. And there are three things that I want to highlight. The first of which is the use of intermediaries in non-criminal proceedings. The second is the amendment of bail con conditions and then flowing from that minimum sentencing in respect of the offence of rape. So starting with the use of intermediaries in non-criminal proceedings, the suggested amendment is that this is left to the discretion of the courts when we come to specified groups. And the specified groups are a witness under the biological or mental age of 18 who suffers from physical, psychological, mental, or emotional conditions, or an elderly person. And this discretion is given to the court when the court thinks, the court thinks, it appears to the court that the witness will be exposed to undue psychological, mental, or emotional stress, trauma, or suffering. Now, our concern here is that this is going to lead to inconsistent application. There is already a constitutional court's judgment, Director of Public Prosecutions, Transvaal versus Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development. That is, of course, quite old because we still speak about uh, Transvaal here, but in any event, um, where the court also, this was challenged before the constitutional court that there could be inconsistent application. Our submission is that especially when we come to children, but in fact, all these vulnerable groups that are mentioned here, um, not only children, biological or mental age of 18 years and below, persons who suffer from physical, psychological, mental, emotional conditions and elderly persons, all these groups are vulnerable. So it's very difficult for us to imagine a situation when there won't be undue psychological, mental, or emotional stress, trauma, or suffering when it comes to a court environment. So, and we also have a problem. We have a concern with this being a discretion of the court because, look, it's a reality. Judges are, they, yes, they are um, supposed to, they sign an oath that they are magistrates, the court, that they must be um, objective, that they mustn't be influenced by outside factors. But the reality is uh, judges are humans, magistrates are humans. Therefore, um, this, the best interest of the child would, in our understanding, make it compulsory in any proceedings, whether it's criminal, whether it's non-criminal, to make it compulsory to appoint an intermediary. This shouldn't be something that is left to the discretion of a judge or a magistrate. So this is our submission on intermediaries. Then the amendment of bail conditions. So if I can just ask you, if I can interrupt myself, how are we looking for time? You are left with five minutes. Oh, I will quickly just um, sum this up so that I can hand over to my colleague. We also, um, with the bail conditions, as well as the minimum sentencing, we have certain constitutional um, concerns, especially around bail conditions. There's a very difficult balance that must be struck between a victim's safety and the accused right to bail in terms of the constitution. Then minimum sentencing, I have to also agree with the previous presenter um, that there are no real proof that there will be um, guarantees of rehabilitation, protection of victims, and the reduction of crime. I now, now hand over to my colleague, Rupa Fatso Maposa, who will be dealing with the Criminal Law, Sexual Offences and Related Matters Amendment Act. Thank you. Yeah. Well, before she proceeds, I made a mistake. Uh, you are supposed to finish at 11.45. It's now 11.37, which means we have seven minutes. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Fine. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone, uh, colleagues, fellow presenters, and members of the committee. I would like to express our appreciation once again for the opportunity to make verbal submissions on the gender-based violence bills. As noted by Ms. Pah, I will be focusing on the Criminal Law Amendment Act Amendment Bill. While there are many notable criminal law amendment acts, I mean, uh, while there are many notable amendments proposed in this bill, I would like to highlight high facts submissions in relation to the proposed amendments of the National Register of Sex Offenders. Firstly, CIFAC welcomes the inclusion of females under the age of 25 years in the identified group of vulnerable persons. We believe it is important to acknowledge that women in South Africa are considerably more likely than men to experience violence in and outside of the home. Murder, which is the most lethal, which is the most lethal expression of violence, is most frequently experienced by women in this age group. Therefore, it is imperative for legislation to expressly recognize women as a vulnerable group in order to effectively monitor state efforts to respond to, prevent, and eliminate all forms of violence against women. However, we note with concern that the recognition of this woman as a vulnerable group is not consistently applied through the pro throughout the proposed provisions. And this has also been highlighted by my colleague. For instance, in our recent submissions, we highlighted clause seven subsection A of this amendment bill, which seeks to include in the register the particulars of persons convicted or alleged to have committed any sexual offense against a child or a person who is mentally disabled. While females under the age of 25 years are identified as a vulnerable group, the details of their perpetrators will be excluded from the register because this particular provision only applies to children or persons who are mentally disabled. Therefore, this provision is contrary to the objective of protecting persons who are vulnerable against sexual offenders. The second problematic uh, provision in the amendment bill is the provision that seeks to make the particulars of persons who have been convicted of sexual offenses publicly available. This provision is similar to the American federal law, which is known as Megan's law. This, pro this law in America provides for the release of information concerning a sexual offender when it is necessary to protect the public. To this end, websites have been created and made available for public viewing. However, the US has faced great obstacles in the implementation and maintenance of such registers. As a result, the information obtained from the websites is not always accurate. We are concerned that South Africa will find itself in a similar predicament, especially since there are already challenges with the implementation of the National Register in its current form. While we understand the objective of this provision, that is to protect vulnerable per persons, it is also important to consider the constitutionality of such a provision. Should it be passed into law, we are concerned that this provision is likely to face constitutional challenges on the grounds that it violates the right to privacy, equality, and dignity of the registrants. These rights can indeed be limited under Section 36 if it is reasonable and justifiable to do so in an open and democratic society based on the values of human dignity, freedom, and equality. Ultimately, the rights of the registrants need to be weighed against the public's right to information and to freedom and security of the person in terms of Section 36. The following factors must be considered in determining whether the limitation of the listed person's rights will be justifiable. First, we need to look at the nature of the right or rights that will be affected by such a provision. In this case, as indicated, the proposed provision is likely to affect the rights to privacy, dignity, and equality of persons listed in the register. In Benston and others versus Vesta NO and others, the Constitutional Court explained that the right to privacy consists essentially of the right to lead, to lead one's life with minimum interference. It also concerns, and I quote, honor and reputation, avoidance of being placed in a false light, and non-revelation of irrelevant and embarrassing facts, close quote. While the information that will be made publicly accessible is indeed relevant, it will undoubtedly affect the reputation of the registrants and place them in a negative light. Therefore, we also need to, in, to look at the link between privacy and dignity. In the Kumalo case, the court also held, and I quote once again, no sharp lines can be drawn between reputation, dignitas, and privacy in giving effect to the value of human dignity in our constitution, close quote. The provision that the personal details of persons listed on the register must be made publicly available 
will therefore not only violate the right to privacy by revealing one's criminal past, but it will also infringe on the right to dignity and likely result in community ostracism. Furthermore, Clause 7C will also violate the offend offender's rights to equal protection of the law as it distinguishes between offenders convicted for sexual offenses against children and mentally disabled persons and offenders who may have committed similar offenses against adult women. What then is the importance and purpose of limiting such fundamental rights? According to Clause 8 of the Amendment Bill, the purpose of the register is to ensure the protection of vulnerable persons from sexual offenders. Therefore, public access of the register is imperative for the prevention of contact between potential victims and sexual offenders. However, CIFAC raises concern that the objectives of making details of the register publicly available may come at too great an expense to the implicated individual. Individuals register. The nature and extent of the, limit, of the limitation is such that it will effectively punish offenders who may already have saved their sentences. Furthermore, public criminal records will have a negative impact on the reintegration of offenders into society. Not only would their prospects of employment be limited, even in cases where they don't have to work with vulnerable persons, but these offenders will not be welcomed back into society as citizens residing in an area where a sex offender is registered will fear for their safety. We then need to consider whether there is any relation between the limitation of fundamental rights and the purpose of publicizing the register. Evidence from states that have taken the measure of publicizing their sexual offense registers indicate that this does not prevent the commission of sexual offenses. Although policies of this kind are popular and often called for, they are not efficient, effective, or, or equitable. In South Africa, where only a small fraction of reported sexual offense cases are likely to result in a conviction, public access to the register is likely to create a false sense of security among citizens. In an earlier report, the South African Law Reform Commission warned of a real threat that communities might take the law in their own hands and cleanse neighborhoods from offenders, even on the slightest of rumors. It should be noted that the Law Reform Commission conducted extensive research prior to the implementation of the current register that is in, that is in effect, and they found that publicizing the information of convicted sexual offenders would pose a real threat to such offenders. The final question is whether there are any less restrictive means to okay. achieve the purpose. When you round up, you have one minute. Thank you. Uh, well, so we submit that while there are many high risk sexual purposes that need to be closely and consistently monitored by law enforcement, there are less intrusive measures that can be taken to control sex offenders and achieve public safety. For the sake of time, I won't go into details on such measures. However, CIFAC does not support the publicizing of the register for the sole purpose of blaming and shaming sexual offenders. While we acknowledge that public access may encourage vigilantism, this measure cannot be justified constitutionally, it has no rehabilitative effect, and its deterrent value is suspect and will likely give citizens a false sense of security. Therefore, in concluding, our submission is that um, the parliament or lawmakers should instead focus on addressing current administrative challenges faced in the implementation of the register in its current form. Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Irina. Uh, I have noted the following hands, Honorable Noma Temba Maseko Tele, Honorable Kobo Tele Janje, Honorable Mivot Tachins, Honorable Jacqueline Mufuke. Any other hands? Um, let's take those hands in that order. Honorable Maseko Tele. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, also, thank you very much to the presenters. Only have one clarity question. The first one person is about the public uh, reporting to hear their views on this one, because this one uh, also might uh, come with its own threats uh, when it comes to uh, the, the people from the community reporting such uh, acts to the police. I'm saying this, Chairperson, for example, there has been allegation in the, in the community that people, uh, sometimes they go, they call the police, uh, report uh, activities, uh, crime activities uh, in, the, in, the, in the community. 
uh, and that information leak, leak, uh, in fact, leak, it, it does leak, uh, and uh, it's, it's an allegation. It does leak, and you find that uh, those people. Uh, Honorable Tillerson, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, I'm sure that uh, at some, uh, let me say, it comes back and haunts them. I want to hear your view on, on that one, uh, saying that information leak, and you find that the person who has been reported, who has been reported to the police comes back to you and say, well, you, when are you reported this matter? And now that person is now, it becomes a threat to that person. That is number one, she. And then the last one is the is the issue of I want to hear their view on this one that they've just uh, spoken about. Um, uh, the the one the last one that's or the or, or of the register that they're against this uh, uh, information uh, from the register to be publicized. I just want to find out from them have they considered with all that said. I, I do re I respect the decision of the decisions of the court and and whatever the views that they have given. But I want to hear the other side. Have they consider uh, the the rights of the victim vis-a-vis -vis the right of the perpetrator on that issue? And then again, have they uh, add, can, uh, have they maybe not uh, see this as a detergent to at least to make, I don't know whether it's the right way to change it, like something that will make people not to commit this act. It's, it's, it's you know, using this register and uh, the information given to the public to make those who might think to commit the act of GPV not to do it, knowing that the community will know about them. I want to know what their view on that one, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Janje. No, Chair, thank you. I think I did not lower my hand uh, previously, so thanks. I'll skip this. Thank you very much, Honorable Mfuke. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairperson, and thanks for the presentation. Uh, maybe I should also say, say thank you for the spiritual abuse that you support that it should be included. Chair, I have one question. It's on the disciplinary action of subs, South African Police Services members. I hear that uh, they have a problem of implementation, implementation, but now they are suggesting that the oversight role should be done by the Gender Commission. And then the question would be, why not the Independent Police Investigative Directorate? Thank you. Thank you very much. Any member that I did not see that wants to raise his or her question? Um, just trying to scroll so that I don't skip anyone. Uh, seemingly, there are no other hands. Uh, over to you. Uh, can you respond to the comments and questions raised? Um, Mr. Chair, if I may just ask Honorable Mufu King, um, my internet connection um, was interrupted slightly there when she raised her question on the disciplinary action of subs. If she may just please um, repeat that for me. Uh, you said, uh, I think if, if I heard her well, is that uh, your recommendation that it must be done by the gender commission, the disciplinary processes, uh, why not I paid? That was the question. Am I correct, Honorable Mfuke? Yes, Chairperson, you are correct. Thank you very much. Over to you. Okay, thank you. I will um, deal with the question on the threats um, of a person from the community reporting, as well as Honourable Mofo King's um, question, and then Ropa will attend to the register of sex offenders. Um, I 100% agree with you, um, um, Honourable Masipichele, um, that yes, it's the confidentiality of these reporting duties are problematic um, because already that might be something that prevents victims and, uh, of uh, domestic violence from reporting the, the fear that it won't be confidential. And very often, um, victims don't want to 
make it known that they are victims of domestic violence in whatever form it may be. So the fact that a third party can intervene and report, and then as you very correctly point out, make them open themselves up to threats uh, from the alleged perpetrator, that is problematic. Um, so in as much as we welcome the widening of um, and placing an, a, a duty on the public to report uh, domestic violence incidents, if they are aware of it, it also raises some issues. And um, I am, uh, yeah, it, I, th I think the legislature must be aware of those threats that uh, may arise and the issues that may arise. Then, Honourable Mufu King, um, we are not suggesting that the Commission for Gender Equality are going to be the ones taking disciplinary action. We rather want to see that they are have a type of a, or something like the Commission for Gender um, Equality, that they have an oversight ability, that they oversee that the correct procedure is followed, that the legislation is acting, uh, that, that there is, that the disciplinary action taking place is in line with the legislation. So we don't want, the, we, we're not suggesting that the Commission for Gender Equality will be the one taking disciplinary action, but instead to have an oversight to, or, or even that there must be reporting done. There's already reporting requirements um, on disciplinary action that is taken, but that, they, that it must almost be more than one body or institution or organization that must be reported to when disciplinary action is being taken. Thank you. I will now hand over to Ropa to deal with the question on the National Register. Thank you, Ms. Fah. Um, so this question was actually twofold, and I will begin with the first part. The first question was whether we have conceded the rights of victims versus the rights of perpetrators. So in our, our submissions, we give an outline of a Section 36 analysis, which is actually a balancing exercise, balancing the rights of the perpetrator and balancing the rights of victims. And we acknowledge that there is a need to protect victims. There is a need to practice vigilantism. However, as mentioned earlier, we find that the extent of the limitation is unjustifiable in a constitutional democracy such as South Africa, in the sense that it will um, unjustifiably limit the rights of perpetrators. This is not to say that the rights of perpetrators are more important than the rights of potential victims. However, we need to consider to what extent such, an, such a limitation will be enforced practically. And also in the present sense, um, the register as proposed in its current form seeks to protect children, it seeks to protect uh, persons with mental disabilities. This is already done by the NISO in its current form. And so publicizing it, we feel, is an extensive limitation that would likely be constitutionally challenged if such a provision were to be implemented. The second uh, question was whether we have considered any deterrent value of publicizing the register. Uh, as indicated once again, research from other jurisdictions that have similar registers that publicize the details of convicted offenders show that there is actually no deterrent value to, such, to publicizing such information. Therefore, if we are to look at empirical evidence in terms of publicizing registers, we would find that not only is there no rehabilitative effect, but there is also no deterrent value to publicizing the particulars of convicted offenders. I hope I have answered sufficiently. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, then, then let's go to the next uh, organization. Uh, that will be this uh, Burton and others. Do we have uh, Ms. Lisa Burton and others. Uh, Committee Secretariat, have they logged in?
Uh, hello, Che. I'm still checking the, the list, Che. I'm double checking. Honorable Chair, if I may be of assistance, um, Lawyers for Human Rights is one of the others on that list. Um, I, with your permission, I'm just going to uh, give Ms. Vetten a call to see what her estimated time of arrival is. Okay. Thank you. So can't you lead as, as the others if she's not around? Chair, unfortunately not. Um, Ms. Vetten has our presentation, um, which she will be presenting to the committee. I suggest that the committee perhaps proceed with the next presentation uh, in the meantime, so that we do not waste time. Okay. Do we have Songke Gender Justice? I think the challenge might be that uh, we have uh, been ahead of time, so people might think that uh, they are still early. Um, can we give uh, Ms. Bowman some time to ensure that uh, she contacts Ms. Lisa Felton? And then the committee secretariat also uh, contact uh, Songa Gender Justice. Can we resume at five past 12? Chairperson, I, I think it's looking. I see that Ms. Vetten is currently logging in. Oh, is, is looking in. That's correct, thank you. Looking in, but she will still have to have time to mm -hmm. upload uh, uh, her um, presentation. Yeah, yeah, so can we meet at five past 12? Uh, it's another comfort break until five past 12. Thank you, Chair. And then let's also contact then the stronger gender justice so that uh, immediately when we are done with uh, Ms. Lisa Fenton so that we can uh, have them around. Thank you very much. We'll meet at five past 12. Hello, Ms. Fetten. I see you logged on now. You're speaking to see uh, the committee secretary. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you quite well, ma'am. Um, we just took a five minute break to sort, um, we are ahead of time. So I'm gonna make you a co-host so that you can be able to share your presentation. Thank you, so, I was going to, is the yeah. background, my signal at home is really bad. So I've gone out into a public place. I don't know how bad the background noise is because um, I can then move to go and sit in my car if the background noise is very bad. Noise bad. You can hear it's bad. Is it bad? Do you like me to move? Um, can you are, you, are you moving right now? Hello, Ms. Vetten. Hello, ma'am.
Hello, Miss Betten. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, ma'am, I can hear you now. I think your background is um, is a bit better. I, right. I, if you, yeah. I'm just running to my car. I'm going to sit in there. Can you give me another 20 seconds? Yes, we we can see it. Okay. Um, can you try and maybe talk? Uh, yeah, because you, I think sure. the sound is not that clear. Is my sound not that okay? Um, okay. I can right. hear you. I can hear you quite well. Okay, fine. Um, shall I start? Um, the chaperson will come back in any minute now. He will no indicate. Uh, okay. Okay, ma'am. Thanks a lot for now. Uh, the chair will come back any minute now. No problem. <laughs> Uh, can we start? A good day, Ms. Liz, uh, Lisa Thurton and others. Uh, you have 20 minutes to make a presentation. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, the presentation I'm going to deliver is on behalf of approximately 100 organi um, organizations and individuals. We are all drawn from a background either of working directly at the coalface of services to women in abusive relationships or have been researching the area of domestic violence. Um, some of us have been working in this field for up to 30 years and we draw very much on that experience which is informing our um, submission. And I've just given a brief outline of who we are, the Callis Foundation based in the Cape Flats, Gender Health and Justice Unit at the University of Cape Town, University of Johannesburg, Heinrich Bull, Lawyers for Human Rights, Mosaic, the National Shelter Movement, and the Saki Bartman Center for Women and Children. So this is not an individual submission, it's on behalf of a range of organizations. And I will be joined as a co-presenter by my colleague, Dorothea Geertz, from the Saki Bartman Center for Women and Children. So firstly, in brief, the, the act has been revised in a fairly comprehensive way. And I think um, particularly those provisions that deal with procedure, we welcome and support most of those, uh, particularly the move to electronic repository, application and service. We do think it's very important that the act be quite clear that service should not be made on the complainant where she's sharing a residence with the um, respondent. I mean, if he's out and the application is served on her, she's put in an invidious position if he returns home and she must then give it to him. So we think that needs to be addressed by the act. 
We also support the removal of weapons, and we support the broadened definitions proposed by the Act. We have made some specific suggestions in the Act uh, in our submission around how these could also be reworded. But I think for today, we want to focus on one particular issue. So I think I'm just going to give the broad brushstrokes to what we support. We are also welcoming the change in language um, that reduces the scope for individual interpretation and discretion, but we do think that there is a need to be more specific around terms such as, if reasonably possible, is of the opinion, reasonable grounds or suspicion. Um, and we deal with some of that in our comments around the directives proposed in section 18B. But our main submission is really located within the context of the complainant's rights to equality and dignity and the extent to which the proposed amendments actually uphold these rights. And so our chief focus in, uh, in this regard is the new sections 2A and B, existing section 18 and new section 18B. And so our comments examine these provisions specifically in relation co to complainant's autonomy. So there are three sections that we're looking at here is how some of these new provisions in 2A and B deny complainants control over their lives and the decisions that affect them. At the same time, there are other provisions that do affirm, inform, empower, and support complainants' decision-making. And lastly, we think it's necessary to look at what needs to be done to make reporting a more effective and meaningful op option for complainants, to encourage them to want to use it as an option. So I think to begin with, these are the two sections I'm going to initially focus on, and these are the obligations to report. And these obligations are placed on two sets, on two groupings. The one is functionaries, and there is a range of definitions that would include anybody working within a health facility to somebody in higher education, for example. That place, and there is a duty placed on these various functionaries to report if they believe or suspect that a child, a person with a disability, or an older person is being abused. And they, and um, the second category is. <clears throat> an obligation placed on any adult who has knowledge, belief, or suspicion, again, in relation to these four categories, child, person with disability, older person, or adult in abusive relationship, to report. So I want to start with these two duties around reporting, because I think this is where the bulk of our concern lies. Firstly, we want to say, and I think it's very important, that this legislation be far better harmonized to other legislation that already deals with issues of abuse. Um, those, I think, are primary pieces of legislation. The Children's Act, for instance, has established a very comprehensive system of child protection. And we don't think this act should in any way try to um, replace that or dilute it or possibly introduce weaker provisions than already exist. So we would suggest that rather than putting in these provisions, you be guided by the Children's Amendment Act, which places duties on already and sets out this very comprehensive system of how to respond this is dealt with in chapter nine, in sections 150 and 160 of the Children's Amendment Act. Chapter five of the Older Persons Act also puts out, uh, entails a duty to report abuse of older persons and sets out a very comprehensive scope of provisions around how these reports are to be dealt with. And then I think in relation to intellectual disabilities, in terms of the Criminal Procedure Act, we we'll already have a duty to report um, sexual offences committed against persons with intellectual disabilities who will also be covered by, uh, in terms of other forms of abuse when they are children, in terms of the Children's Act. So what we point to, and I'm going to come to it at the end, is a particular set of gaps around people with this, uh, around people whose disabilities are not of an intellectual nature. And I think an unfortunate conflation going on between different kinds of inter intellect, uh, between different kinds of disabilities. But I'm going to pick those up a little bit later. I think what I want to really focus on is the area that really concerns us and that this is the obligation to report adult persons. Now, I think it's useful, and I, this is not intended to be a law lecture, but I think it's very useful to perhaps give a bit of a history of the way in which women's rights within marriage have been restricted. This provision will impact disproportionately upon women, even though it's using the gender neutral language of adult persons, because it is primarily adult women who are reporting abuse and who are experiencing uh, domestic violence. So the impact of this prov provision is disproportionately upon women. And this is why I think it starts to go to questions of their equality, because this set of provisions is proposing that they be treated differently to other adults 
and that in ways that are not advantageous, in ways that are actually placing, I think, implicit comments on their legal and mental capacity. So I want to very briefly sketch out the 2,000 year long attempt to give women in relationships the rights over themselves and the right to make decisions so that you can understand how these provisions potentially take away some of what has taken so long to be obtained by adult women. So I think if we look at Roman Dutch law, which is, was prominent in South Africa, if we look at the origins of that in Roman law and the way through the Patria Potestis, it gave the head of the Roman of the family almost complete powers over and control over wife, child, slaves, descendants, and freedmen. That may have changed, but that original structure of, co of control and rights over um, wife and children has remained in place. I think we could see when um, customary law was first codified in, 19, in 1878 through the, through the Natal Code, it's represented, I think, some of an intermingling of some of these inherent, of these ideas taken from Roman law, as well as those present, present in customary law, which embedded the notion that wives were to be subjugated to uh, a woman, to men, children's their father or other adult descendant and the rule of, prim of primogeniture. And this, I think, was further entrenched from, a, from being provincial to being national through the Black Administration Act of 1927, where black women were treated as perpetual minors, irrespective of their age or marital status. And I think one can find the most ugly manifestation of these powers in the last decision to uphold men's exemption from being... I mean, this is less than 30 years ago, we have a legal decision that talks about husbands having complete guardianship and authority of their wives' property as well as over their bodies, and that they are entitled to meet any resistance to the enjoyment of their marital privileges with force or violent conduct. But that was the last of the such decisions in 1993. Um, the Prevention of Family Violence Act was introduced, which also removed the last vestiges of marital power, so the last rights that men had to may have decisions over <coughs> their female partners through the Prevention of Family, Family Violence Act that was removed specifically in relation to white, colored, and Indian women. And African women had to wait a few more years through the Customary Marriages Act when they were finally granted equal status and capacity in marriage and were no longer minors. So in other words, it has taken, it took more than 2,000 years to give women the full capacity of adults in relation to making decisions about themselves and their lives. And I think this particular provision around mandatory reporting is reversing elements of that. What it is doing is shifting women from the private patriarchy within relationships that was endorsed and upheld by, the, uh, by law into public paternalism. Responsibilities, their freedoms can be restricted and limited on the basis of their best interests. That's a group of people can exert particular powers and limit those of others on the basis of paternalistic principles of best interests. Um, the same, I think, with the notion of benevolent sexism, which again is suggesting that there is a category of women who can be treated differently to others, who can have their freedoms and responsibilities diminished, again, because others know better than them. Now, I think what this is doing is that it's allowing other people to override women's decisions, and this mimics many of the controlling features of abusive relationships, where again, once in an, once the distinguishing features of, of an abusive relationship is this attempt to utterly control decision making from what you wear to the way you to how you how you style your hair to where you go and to who you speak to, and that in a sense this mandatory reporting, which is removing the decision from women as to when they want to report and who they want to report to, and giving this power to everybody and saying that they can legitimately exercise this power over the complainant. We do not give these rights. I cannot find a parallel of these kinds of rights over an adult who, has, who exercises mental competence anywhere else. I mean, I think the other problem with this provision is that it suggests that women are only allowed to make decisions that we like and we understand. It says that we don't trust or respect complainants' assessments of their own circumstances or their, um, or, their, or their choices, that we don't want to inquire into why they don't report, and we don't think that they might have good reasons why they don't report, and that we understand their situations and options better than they do. 
And once again, I think this echoes what very many abusive men tell their female partners, that they exercise pro-judgment, that they don't know what they're doing, that they're stupid and can't think for themselves and need their partners to do that. I think the other point about this is that it relates, it links women to some very, because it's, it's, it's suggesting they do not have, that they cannot make decisions and that their decisions cannot be trusted. It's <laughs> resurrecting some old pathologizing and stigmatizing beliefs about women in abusive relationships and their mental capacity. We have a long history in psychology of suggesting that women who are in abusive relationships, who remain in abusive relationships, don't leave those relationships, are too psychologically damaged to think for themselves. And in fact, there was an attempt in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in the early 1990s to entrench this as a psychological disorder, and it was defeated for precisely the reasons that it patronizes and misunderstands the nature of abuse. So it's a bit concerning that we're finding elements of these ideas that women can't think for themselves or are too psychologically damaged to reinsert this right to make decisions on women's behalf. It's very inappropriate to introduce power dynamics into the context of family relationships and friendships. There should be primary sources of support to complaints, but women, whether women want them to or not, they should, whether, at times it may not, whether women may not want them to report. You are introducing, I think, uncomfortable dynamics into friendships um, and family relationships, and they should be there to support women, and we should feel that they can trust them. Um, and I think this, there is a, there is the potential to endanger this, find out that they may have been talking to others, that others have gone to report, this may prompt violence. And I think we can't overlook the fact that mandatory reporting is not considered good practice. The World Health Organization, for example, strongly discourages its adoption as policy, not least because the evidence supporting its application is so poor. We don't have any evidence to suggest that this is a good thing to do. I think it also has, it, it raises concerns in relation to confidentiality and what is good empowering therapeutic practice. And so I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Dorothea Kurtz um, from Sarki Bartman to speak as a social worker, to speak of the impact of this provision on her, her work and her work with women at the shelter and to seek Sarki Bartman services. Dorothea, are you there? I want to Sorry, remind you. Yes, okay. I want to. I want to remind you before you start that you have eight minutes. Okay. Good day, Chairperson and all members, and thank you for this opportunity. I've been working as a social worker at the Saki Bartman Center for the last ten to eleven years in the field of gender-based violence. And I believe that I have a good understanding of where our victim is coming from and what our victim is, um, is saying to us. And today, my aim is to talk on behalf of that victim. So what she is saying to us is that she ultimately wants to make her own decisions. She is asking of us not to take away the last little bit of power that she still has left. I think we all understand what basically happens within an abusive um, relationship, and we all know that the perpetrator is the one that is in control. The perpetrator is the one that makes all the decisions. That woman is completely powerless and she has no say within that relationship. And I think ultimately, um, if we implement this bill as it is, that it's the same thing that we will be doing. We will be taking away her power and we will be doing, uh, we're not allowing her to be part of the process and, and to consent to anything. I believe our role is to empower the vulnerable women and children and, it is, and, and we should um, secure systems and structures, um, make sure that is in place for when that woman is ready to leave that relationship. I think we also understand that in most cases, the woman will go back to her perpetrator seven times before she finally will leave that relationship. And ultimately that is her choice and her decision to do so. And our work is to make sure that we are ready for her and that we have the systems in place to assist her. If we look at the confidential um, relationship, if we look at confidentiality and the relationship that we as social workers have with our clients, we go into a confidentiality agreement with our clients. Um, and, and with that, we allow that woman to come to us and to talk to us about anything, knowing that it won't leave the space of that room. 
Now, with implementation of this bill, we now have a duty to report without even without the consent of the client, even if that is not the reason why the client came to see us, we need to report this matter. What is going to happen at the end of the day is the client is not going to trust the social worker anymore. The client is not going to use that safe space anymore. Once the community, once the woman out there become aware of this bill and they, become, and they understand the implications of this bill, Women are not going to come forward anymore. Women are not going to come and speak to the social workers anymore. We are not going to know what is happening in our communities and we are not going to know what is happening within those families at the end of the day. This will mean that that woman will be stuck in that abusive relationship because she will be too scared to speak to a social worker. We also know very well how the perpetrators operate and we do also know that they are highly skilled in what they do. So they will also just find better ways to hide what they are doing. They will find better ways to hide um, the abuse that is happening. And at the end of the day, I believe that the long run of when, when, when we look into the future, this will put that woman and children more at risk because now she's not trusting the social worker. She's not coming forward to ask for help. She is just, she will try to keep it a secret. Currently what is happening and what has been happening up until now, the space that we create for that woman is where she can come to us, she can come and ask us for help, for advice, for support. We use that space to educate her about her rights. We use that space to talk about the protection order, to help her to get the protection order. And we will talk about, uh, we will talk about options. You know, when you're ready to leave, this is what is going to happen. This is where you will go. We will talk about shelters. We will talk about the courts. We will educate the, uh, the, the woman about all of her rights. And we will help her with the safety plan. In most cases, the safety plan is the one that saves the woman. But now if the, the, the victim is going to avoid going to the social workers, how will we reach that woman? We also need to understand that when we when we save a woman, when we rescue a woman, it is not just the practical side of it. So it's not just about getting her out of the situation, getting her into a shelter, getting her to court and getting the protection order. And it's also not just not about not just about getting the perpetrators into jail and getting prosecuted. Yes, that is a big part of it. But the other part of it is also the healing and restoration that needs to be done. That woman needs to be healed. And that, that, that is our role. That is our role as social worker. That is our role as So if the if the victim is now avoiding the social workers, if the victim is now not trusting the social workers. How are we supposed to do our work at the end of the day? And how are we supposed to help this woman um, to restore her life again and to empower again if she is now not going to trust the, the, the relationship with the social worker because we have violated that confidentiality agreement um, with her? So, thank you. Thank you. So I think what you want to say in brief conclusion... <sighs> I'm sorry, the presentation is, appears to have disappeared briefly. Is what you want to say in conclusion is that if an adult person wants somebody to report on their behalf, that is permissible and is already available in the Act. Um, otherwise, a denial of adult autonomy cannot be justified, especially because there is absolutely no further help as forthcoming, uh, forthcoming as a result of um, such reporting. It's reporting for the sake of abuse of, of, of reporting. There is no housing options offered to women. There is no 24-hour protections from the police offered to women. There is no um, additional monies offered in order to be able to them to live independently of their abusers. There are no jobs offered. So we cannot see a good basis for, for um, denying adults autonomy. I'm aware that our time is running out, so I'm going to try and just quickly rush a bit. But I think we do need to also say that the position of people with disabilities and the way the act is treating them is also not doing a good job of differentiating between their different level, their different capacities. Um, disability exists on a spectrum from mild to moderate to severe. They cannot be conflated. People whose disabilities are mild and moderate and of a, of, of a physical nature ought to be allowed the same kind of decision-making capacity that anybody else has. But I think there is a need to focus on people with severe to profound to profound disabilities and I don't think the, the um, proposed recommendations do this sufficiently and we have some recommendations and relations to directives around how it can how that can be done. I think 
while we don't uh, we do not support those provisions that take away and deny women their autonomy thank you very much your time is up okay we have put the and they just to conclude then we have other recommendations which are in our submission and we can take these further in the discussion thank you thank you very much i have noted the following members um, Ms. Honorable Verna Hall, Honorable Maseko Tulu, Honorable Nivold Trachens, Honorable Jekim Fuke. Um, any other member? We would also still be encouraging members from other committees who are part of us if they want to raise issues, they are allowed to do that in terms of the rules. Uh, let's start with Honorable Horn. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and, and thank you for the, the presentation. I think the, the gist of the presentation, if I understood it correctly, is about the, the issues the presenters and the, the different bodies they do represent have with mandatory reporting. And I think, firstly, we must ask them to comment on the fact that even though we as legislators in this committee is, uh, uh, and I can assure them, I think on behalf of everyone, is absolutely not blind to the fact that the, the overwhelming majority of victims of sexual violence and domestic violence are female, that, that we ultimately deal with, with legislation that, that for good reason, apart from the constitutional imperative, also for the reason that, that I think the last I saw was indication that up to 10% of men may also suffer uh, domestic violence related abuse. That we deal with gender neutral legislation. So therefore, firstly, I think we, we, we need to, to, to encourage them to, to say to us whether their stance ultimately should be adopted given the fact that we cannot uh, simply accept that this is, is ultimately damaging to the autonomy of, of women. So that's the first aspect. The, uh, the second aspect, Chair, is um, I want to make the statement that in the presentation itself, there seems to be a, a contradiction in the argument around uh, mandatory reporting. I mean, words like perpetrators are highly skilled, part of the, the issues that is to be addressed by us as a society is the fact that, that women feel that they um, do not have control of the situation. They are not making decisions for themselves. But yet it is quite clear that in a specific uh, um, percentage of specifically domestic violence-related uh, offences, but also even sexual offenses, as the, the very element of also intimidating, threatening, harassing, harassing and ultimately, um, yeah, uh, threatening and harassing specifically female victims is of such a nature as to silence them. So the difficulty with, 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 um, with not supporting mandatory reporting then for those who, who live on the, who are present on the periphery of the lives of these people, are that, that by not supporting mandatory reporting, we, as a consequence, could also perpetuate the, the very abusive and the specific abuse in those relationships. And, and, and the, by simply saying that we cannot support mandatory reporting because it takes away the authority uh, um, of these these victims over their, their own lives uh, seems to be a contradiction. And then lastly, in respect of the, the, the issue of mandatory reporting, I mean, right at the, the outset of this presentation, we were appraised of, of the patriarchal 
elements still today in our society having its roots in the in in, in so far back as the Roman law and then obviously also the 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 customary laws in in Africa and that's all well and fine but I want to say that in both of those societies in the case of the Roman law we we talk of the Bonnie Mores and in in the case of the the uh customary law, we, we know of principles like Ubuntu, which ultimately, to my mind, also, in any event, places an implied responsibility on those who see abuse, who see violence that is not being attended to, to, to come forward in order for it to be formally addressed. And, and shouldn't we just see the, the codification of that moral responsibility we all have in the light of the fact that that we are as it is seemingly not winning this war on gender-based and, and sexual violence and that therefore in the circumstances for now uh, we must remind members of society who, 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 who choose to turn a blind eye about the responsibility all of us have to assist victims so, so i yeah in conclusion i struggle to to see to support and understand the rationale behind this argument. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Juan. Honorable Namutamba, Ms. Okochele. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Lisa and the team. Uh, Chairperson, I just want to, I only have one of one question or an important comment. Much as Lisa, we, 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 we respect uh, the rights of women when it comes to reporting. And, but I want you to, I want your view uh, in, when it comes to the issues of withdrawal of cases by the same women mm. uh, that we are trying to help here. Uh, mm. If you are saying uh, you don't, you are not for, Man, 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 mandatory uh, reporting. What is your view on that issue? Mm. Uh, also, I don't know because uh, some of us, we, we can tell you real stories about the issue. I think this uh, issue of reporting, it will come handy to some groups of women. Because if we are going to group women in, into one class, the experiences of women under the same level, uh, I think we won't be able to address this issue because we have different levels. Women are at the different levels in the community. There are those who are at the ladder, higher uh, uh, level of a ladder. There are those who are in the middle. There are those who are really down at the end of the ladder. <laughs> and uh, sometimes, uh, 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 if you look at these levels, you cannot address them with the same uh, 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 answer in, in all the problems that they have. I, I, I might, maybe I, I would want to understand your, 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 your view on this from that perspective. On, uh, you, you are also mentioning the issue of co uh, they are respecting their confidentiality. What about the rights of those children that are experiencing domestic violence in their houses and they are not able to report these matters? I'm talking about children. I'm talking about relatives who are aware of what is happening and then uh, also the neighbors. Because you find that when we go to court, if you listen after somebody has been killed, you will hear somebody saying, you know, he used to beat him in front of us, and but he will forgive, she will forgive this person. And now look, she is dead. And people live with guilty of not have uh, uh, been reported that matter. Uh, I think I need your view on that one. Because also, you must also consider the issue of the low self-esteem also on, on this issue. Because there are those women who they are, with due respect, they are low, uh, they, they, they are not at that level where they can be able to stand for, them, for themselves. They need somebody to help them. So I think the system 
will be there for also for them uh, in order to for them to be able to be accommodated. What is your view on that one? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Honorable new vote reference. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. And also thank you to Ms. Vetten. Yeah, thank you, Lisa Vetten and your organizations for the presentation. Um, I wasn't very clear about what you were saying about people with disabilities. Um, I just need further clarity on that. And But at the same time, I don't want the law to limit people with mental disabilities. I am very happy with the term of vulnerable groups because it covers all the people who are, are vulnerable to abuse. It covers all of them because I am aware that abuse to children who are deaf, knowing that the deaf children can't express themselves because there's a lack of interpreters in the area and the abuse happens because of that knowledge. So I'm, I am very happy with the term vulnerable groups that it covers all the different kinds of um, disabilities and everybody and the spectrum as well of disability that you mentioned. So I just need clarity on what you were saying about dis in terms of disability. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mukuke. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thanks uh, to Lisa and the 100 plus uh, organizations. We really thank you for that. Um, I think one will say that uh, maybe the recommendation on adult persons is noted, something that the um, uh, members of the portfolio committee would look at. I want to check on the matter that you raised at your closing to say that uh, most of the time the abused or those women or whoever is in the situation, they find themselves without resources or money. Are you thinking that uh, it will be the state that can be responsible for them to be taken care of? And I'm saying this because I've seen that in New Zealand, they have just passed a piece of legislation that will grant victims of domestic violence, I think a 10 days uh, paid leave as they move out and all that, which we are not support of a victim to move out. We are support of a perpetrator to be moving out. So what would you say in that regard? Because is it, it's true that most of them, they find themselves challenged and you find that the abuser most of the time is the one who's having resources. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Cooking. Any other member who has a question? Who um might not have seen uh, none. Uh, can you respond to the issues raised? Ms. Lisa Fetton and your... Thank you. I am going to start off with, I hope, um, caps them in the order that they have been um, asked. Firstly, the question of gender. It's quite correct that both men and women can be abused. However, as uh, Honourable Horn noted, it is, the impact is disproportionately upon women, and that has got to do with the way that the law has been structured. Nonetheless, whether decision-making is taken away from men or women, it is wrong to take away from an adult person the right to have autonomy over their lives, the right to decision-making and control, whether women or men. Our concern is that the impact is going to be disproportionately upon women and reinforce a whole range of very old gender stereotypes that have also created higher, uh, gender hierarchies and have had a greater impact on limiting women's decisions in comparison to men. But the point is the same, whether it's a, uh, whether it's a man or a woman. So that would be, uh, so that would be the, first, the first response. The second, I think, is relating to this question of mandatory reporting. I don't think anybody would disagree with the point that we should not intervene in domestic violence. The issue we are problematizing is, is, is mandatory reporting the best form of intervention? And we are saying no. I, haven't fin I wasn't able to finish my presentation, so we did make propositions and suggestions around what we think are better forms of, inter of intervention that do enhance, support, inform, and affirm 
the decision making of those who are in abusive relationships. And we've set out a range of them. So things like providing information. So I think the directives that place where there's a recommendation, for instance, I'll, I'll use the example of health workers. That's very important. For far too long, uh, health, worker, health workers have seen women in casualty, and it might be the same woman in the space of three months appearing again and again with injuries, and they're not asking why she's being injured, and they're not giving her a referral. The appropriate intervention then is to be asking her about what is happening at home in her life. Is everything all right? That is an appropriate intervention that signals it is appropriate that the woman can speak about what is happening and that one doesn't need to look away and remain silent. That is much more empowering of her than simply rushing off to report whether she wanted you to or not. That is telling her what her options are. It is giving her her options. It is putting her in touch with help and it is enabling her to seek help and also the kind of help that she would like. So I think we are not saying do not intervene in domestic violence. What we are saying is the nature of the intervention has to be very carefully thought through and mandatory reporting is not necessarily carefully thought through. When it comes to children, there is already an obligation to report. So I think children with disabilities are, would be covered by those provisions in the Children's, um, the Children's Act and its amendment, as well as the comprehensive system of child protection. The same goes with older persons. The cons so, there, so, so those are comprehensive forms of intervention. They are there. This act must make reference to them and must draw on them and must encourage those to be used. The concern is in relation to adults and mandatory reporting. So we've made a range of other suggestions around, I think, how we can properly give women, the, or men for that matter, the proper support to be able to do what is needed to be able to leave a relationship or do whatever else they need to do in their relationship to support and protect themselves. So I think this, and I, I think the point that's been raised about withdrawal goes to the point that we are trying to make, is that it's all very well to report, but if, for what, if the, but women are going to withdraw if they have not been given proper protections, if they do not have other options like being able to leave or like being able to get a job and reduce their economic dependence on their partner, then they are going to withdraw. So there is no point in making, man, making reporting mandatory if the necessary supports have not been in, put in place. And so I'd like to go to the last honorable member who I think is starting to raise the kinds of necessary social supports that should be in place. So New Zealand is one option. Another option is, for example, for this committee to encourage and possibly write in as a directive or instruction, the Department of Human Settlement Special Housing Needs Policy. This does pay attention to the needs of those in abusive relationships and does give them some kind of fast track access to housing. For this committee to be able to ensure that that policy, which has been on ice since 2015, is put into effect would be extremely helpful. There are other options, I think, that look at some of the options that are currently existing around um, job skills training, things like the Harambee B initiative. I think if this committee was to say that the directives and instructions were to look at a far wider range of social supports than is currently the case, that would be empowering and enabling of women's decisions. So I think what we are wanting to say is, do not take the decision away from women to report. Rather, strengthen, build on those sections of the act that talk about positive duties to inform women of their options, to create a broader range of options through the necessary directives and instructions, which I think then comes to the point around disability that I want to make. I think one of the difficulties that can be faced by people with disabilities that people treat all disabilities as exactly the same in exactly the same way. They don't recognize that there are um, differences in the degree and range and severity, which will have implications for the degree of support and protections that need to be provided. So for this, at this point in time, for example, there is not, I would say, adequate protection for people with severe to, to profound disabilities who have multiple disabilities. There is no some of the, our legislation dealing with help looks at this, but there isn't a duty to report or to think about people who are in that position, who are dependent on care, and because of the way in which they are so dependent on care, may not be in a position to report. 
The directives and instructions talk generally about people with disabilities, but I think there has to be a very particular focus on the need for the to pay attention to people with severe to pro and, and profound disability. <coughs> So that is one area where we don't feel there is sufficient differentiation. I think there's also the concern that while the Children's Act covers children with disabilities, once those children become adults, some of those protections are going to disappear, especially in relation to people with intellectual disabilities. There needs to be much more thought. I think the, in, the instructions the directive start to point in that direction, but they need to be given much more specific shape in order to recognize that all disability is not the same. And as it is, I think very often, people with physical disabilities, it has been insultingly assumed that their intellectual capacities are diminished. And I don't think we want to do that. Um, we are trying to encourage and empower people with disabilities, including through the employment equity, and we should not be in any way, I think, suggesting that all disabilities are the same, all people's um, mental capacity has been differentiated and therefore they, they lose the right they all lose the right to decision making. We need to distinguish between the different kinds of disabilities and we need to put more emphasis, which doesn't currently sufficiently exist, on people with severe to profound disabilities and what needs to be done about them and um, care. So I hope I have addressed some of the, of, 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 I hope I have addressed some of the, the questions. And I think again, I just want to emphasize that what this act starts to do, which is important, is recognize that domestic violence is more than a problem of the police and the courts, that it is, a it is the responsibility of health, education, and social development. It starts to do that, but it doesn't go far enough. And at the end of the day, I think what it should be doing is not saying go and report, which takes it back to the police and the courts, but look at how can we empower women's capacity to make decisions through the use of the health sector and through um, social development services because that is where it's appropriate to be providing some of this kind of social support. I hope that has answered some of the questions. Thank you very much. And have you been able Hello? to raise everything that you wanted to raise in terms of your recommendation? I think we've raised the, our submission sets out a range of different recommendations. And one I would like to um, perhaps focus on a, a little more is this question of risk assessment. The act references it, but I think the way in which it is dealt with suggests that this will be a written checklist, which somebody will tick a couple of boxes and then refer to a service. Again, if we talk about comprehensive safety, that will not be sufficient. We would like to see the notion of risk assessment developed much better through directives um, and instructions that will, I think, also be appropriately located with people who work predominantly in the counseling services because I think they're in a better position to assess risk than potentially a police officer. And what we would like to see is a system of risk assessment that isn't just about ticking boxes on checklists. It's about how do you integrate a system of the police, the court, health facility, shelters, and counseling services to work together to provide integrated, uh, integrated systems. There are examples of other countries in the world, and I would like to go back to, again to the last honorable member asking about these examples, which we can share with you, which are about multi-agency risk assessments that look at creating precisely these kinds of comprehensive integrated systems of protection. And so I think our last, one of our last recommendations that we'd like to look at is that one of the areas in which much more attention needs to be paid and should inform a risk assessment is the situations of women who are either still beaten when in possession of protection orders or who are murdered by their partners while in possession of protection orders. We would like to propose that one of the things that the police and the civilian secretariat for police services should be reporting on in their six monthly reports to parliament is the number of cases where a killing has occurred within either the, the context of a protection an application being made or in process or when a protection order is already in place if we look at if we start to look at those cases and understand why those women children men still died even though there was a protection order that will help us to understand the nature of risk much better, as well as start to distinguish who is at high risk of being more severely beaten and of dying, and therefore what are the effective measures that need to be put in place, to go back to what one of the other honorable members was saying, 
for that particular category of women who may be at particularly high risk. So we would like to start, we would suggest that this information on those who are dying be, rep be reported and that those cases be investigated to help us start developing the system of risk assessment and to understand what can be done. In that way, I think we will have a much more expanded system of protection that is also informed by the facts of what is happening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Lisa Fratten, uh, and to your colleague. Thank you for the presentations. We will now invite Sonke Janda Justice to make their presentation. Good um, afternoon, Honorable Members. Um, may I get permission to share my presentation? Yes, thank you very much. I think we appreciate it. Yes. So, Sonke Janda Justice, you have 20 minutes. Uh, to make a presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, good afternoon again, and thank you for this opportunity. So just by way of introduction and background, um, Sonke Gender Justice is a nonprofit established in 2006, and uh, with, in respect to the Policy Development Advocacy Unit, we utilize several strategies to support Sonke's objectives of ensuring um, or trying to Co uh, contribute to creating necessary uh, environment for men, women, gender non-conforming individuals, young people and children to enjoy equitable, healthy and happy relationships to the development of a just and democratic society. And we do so through strategic litigation, research, legal opinions and uh, policy submissions and workshops with communities. So Sonke has made submissions on all three related goals. So I will, for the sake of time, just quickly, you know, scan over the, the highlights and obviously our main submissions are, are more comprehensive. So in relation to the criminal law and sexual offences and related matters amendment, um, and in particular around the National Register for Sexual Offenders, I think at the outset we need to highlight that we are not um, in complete support of this. Um, and I think some of the discussions has been mentioned yesterday around, you know, alternatives such as the criminal records database by the South African Police Service. Um, and also to highlight the management of the current um, NRSO has been poorly run and the, the data has been discussed yesterday in, in two presentations by the Centre for Child Law and um, the Children's Institute. So essentially there is currently a great deal of financial resources poured into the maintaining of this register, which is not currently being done well. So if the you know, committee decides that the proposal for the NRSO does have to, does proceed in, in opposed to, for example, the alternative, um, we note that it has to be done in a way that it is effective and it main, is, should be maintained properly. But noting that in this context, we're saying that we should rather um, filter resources into one workable database. Um, we also have concerns around Section 7C4, which essentially says that they want to disclose the full name and the full details of, you know, the person whose particulars have been included in the register, which would then be available on the Department of Justice and Constitutional website. And we have some concerns around uh, the register being made public. Um, this can often lead to, to mob justice, for example, and communities taking matters in their own hands or retaliations or even action taken against, you know, the families of said convicted persons. Um, in addition, we would note that the, you know, making the register public may give a false sense of security um, in terms of whether or not this is effective in uh, addressing the, the rates of domestic violence or gender-based violence in general. Um, and we note that the register needs to be managed to find a balance between the objectives and not doing damage in the long run. Um, and take a more multifaceted approach to addressing SGBV. Um, we do welcome the, the development and expansion of the, the 
the NS, NISO to, to include all vulnerable persons. Um, and we felt that, you know, I think there was some discussion earlier on about, you know, incidences happening outside of the employee-employer relationship. And for example, in, in cases of, of sexual assault or sexual offenses cases happening in, in the clergy. Um, so we, we do welcome that. And moving on to the criminal and related matters amendment bill. Um, overall general comments, we support the appointment of intermediaries for proceedings other than criminal proceedings. And we commend the work and efforts of the drafters to take a more um, interactive and engaged approach on the criminal justice system in a, a safe and positive manner. Um, I will now address three points in relation to substantive comments around this particular bill. Firstly, around bail. Um, Section 35 1F of the Constitution has granted the right to have bail if it is in the interest of justice to do so. So while we support the, the, the general approach of the reasonable restriction of police bail and prosecutor bail in cases where there's reason to believe that the accused, um, if not detained, will, you know, the victim will be in immediate danger, we do not necessarily accept clauses two and three in terms of 59.1 and section 59A of the CPA. Um, so the proposed amendment requires the accused to remain in custody until trial and that they show evidence that will satisfy the court that it is interest in justice not to be not to detain them. Essentially, this renders the detention as a default position for offenders in domestic relationships and that bail would be the exception, um, which we feel is at odds with Section 35 1F of the Constitution. Secondly, overcrowding conditions um, do not provide an environment that is conducive for reflection or rehabilitation for accused. And the denial of bail has not proven to be beneficial for the rehabilitation of, of the accused or the safety or, or the members in the community overall. And we would state that the research has shown in the past 20 years, there's no evidence um, to suggest that there is a correlation between similar amendments and a curb of violence in the country. So in fact, similar provisions have resulted in serious miscarriages of justice for a rating trial of persons. We do support clauses four and five that seek to amend section 60 and 68 of the CPA to include more victim um, centered approach. And we believe that a victim centered approach would be in line with the constitutionally mandated uh, interests of justice. And that would contribute to the experience of the, the criminal justice system and a positive experience for, for victims. But we need to ensure that in, in terms of the bill, that it does need to address the expeditious processing of bail applications in domestic violence cases where there is urgent uh, necessity. And we believe that if this was done, it could ensure that most offenders who are detained are those that have been convicted and only accused persons who pose a serious threat to victims. And this would essentially garner more support or trust of, of victims of domestic violence in the criminal justice system. Moving on to the issue of parole, we support the amendment of section 299A1 to include the victim in the parole process, but we would like to caution that this needs to be uh, weighted and balanced with the rights of the accused in, in, in the guaranteed uh, constitutional provision. So as mentioned, we support the victim-centered criminal justice process, but in the absence of a victim's participation, um, if they choose particularly not to, to participate in the process, it should not um, prohibit one's offender's ability to, to apply or be considered for parole. On the issue of minimum sentencing, um, we would like to reiterate some of the previous submissions that um, the bill is aiming to seek tougher you know, sentences on domestic violence offenders. Um, but we note that can be, you know, keeping a person in prison for a longer period of time actually does not necessarily guarantee that they will be rehabilitated nor does it solve the issue of SGBV or make victims safer. So further imprisonment is based on this false premises that punishment and control can you know, address social problems such as poverty, substance dependency, domestic violence, and mental health. And the research has evidenced that the implementation of harsher sentences does not actually have a deterrent effect on, on crime. Uh, so uh, moving on to the submissions on the domestic violence amendment bill, the, our general observations is that we generally welcome the amendments, uh, which we feel will better access justice for survivors of GBV. However, 
we would like to echo some of our um, colleagues that have made previous submissions to say that in terms of you know, the intentions of the bill and implementation, um, if we do not address the structural impediments, um, such as, you know, for example, the systemic challenges within the South African police service and the court systems um, that are that often lead to secondary victimization, um, the, in, the well intention of the DVA amendments will not essentially address the overall needs of, of victims or survivors of, of violence. So we would also like to note that uh, in, in particular, there's a section under the definitions of domestic violence that um, is not gender inclusive. And I note uh, um, one of the honorable members had mentioned that the intention of legislature to is ensure that uh, legislation is gender neutral. So if that is the case, then in particular this example, um, and uh, this was noted in our submissions, then our reference to specific gender pronouns should be removed, that, that it doesn't specifically exclude other gender non-conforming groups or LGBTQI, because in by implication in that definition, it implies that certain groups are not able to be, you know, complainants or respondents in within the DVA, and, and that is not uh, a true reflection of reality. Um, we also note that when, when one mentions trainings, it needs to be emphasized that it needs to take on a feminist, victim-centered, and intersectional approach in dealing with domestic violence at all times that respects the inherent dignity of the complainant. Uh, moving on to specific sections um, within the DVA amendments. So we welcome the definition of, uh, expanded definition of domestic violence, but we would suggest that the, the def, uh, you know, this in, be expanded to include corporal punishment and child neglect within uh, the meaning of this in terms of the Children's Act. And this would also um, concur with the recent constitutional court judgment around the corporal punishment in the home. Um, under the definition of coercive behavior, we would suggest that the um, be extended to include the phenomenon of stealthing, uh, defined as the act of removing a condom during sex without the consent of a partner. We support the reinsertion of the term stalking, which was initially in the act, um, because removal of the, the definition or, or the term stalking from the act fails to acknowledge that this is a form of domestic violence and for, forces to seek um, victim to seek redress through the Protection of Harassment Act. Um, and it may add additional barriers in seeking adequate protection and is not in line with the victim-centered approach recommended in the National Strategic Plan. Section 2A refers to services to complainants related to domestic violence. Um, in, and we note that in order to strengthen the multi-sectoral approach and collaboration, that there will need to be steps taken to ensure that all police stations have databases of all shelters and the focal point contact details of the shelter coordinators within the municipalities and districts um, can refer these complaints to. So this should include a working SAP database with referral uh, details for psychosocial services as required by the complainant. Section 2A1E, um, should be amended to make specific reference to providing an interpreter who doesn't speak um, one of the official languages in South Africa. And this would be to accommodate and um, include or, or accommodate the, the needs of the rights of uh, complainants who are either asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants who are not conversant, who may not be conversant in any of the official languages and still would uh, fall within the categories of people that may be susceptible or susceptible to, to domestic violence. Section 2B deals with the duty to report a commission of acts of domestic violence. And we do not support the uh, section which imposes a duty to report domestic violence against adults, as we state that the criminalization on the failure of the report, uh, reporting of adults uh, may reduce help seeking by women experiencing domestic violence. And it removes a woman's agency and autonomy on whether they want to report such violence. And it also may limit um, family member or, or friends, you know, uh, support to, to the victim of domestic violence for fear of criminal liability. And this essentially increases the vulnerability of women and structural barriers in them obtaining redress. And I think there has been a lot of debate around on this issue um, in the previous submissions. Amendment section four and five of uh, regard to protection orders, we would recommend that the term material interest be defined clearly. Alternatively, that we remove the 
the um, the word materials and change it to any person who has an interest in the well-being of the complainant or related person. And this would then result in broadening the scope of people who can apply for protection orders, which is seemingly what was intended. Amendments to section nine in relation to dangerous weapons. We, we welcome these amendments and note that the amendments um, directing police to seize weapons, regardless of the requirements of um, the respondent's employment to possess such weapon is crucial, noting that um, there are a number of, you know, cases where, for example, there are members of SAPS or anyone employed within the security department that's required to possess a weapon um, has led to, to femicide or even uh, suicide in these cases. We also, in addition to that, recommend that section 93B2 be amended. Um, this because weapons, returning weapons, which uh, I think it, the section caters for the um, a court order designating the return, a possibility of returning weapons after a period of time. And we feel that this goes against the principle of, of um, protecting women from gun violence in domestic violence cases. And what we recommend is that once a weapon is seized in terms of section 9.1, it should not be returned to the respondent or the owner by order of court as indicated. And instead, that they should provide that any weapon seized in connection with the domestic violence case be confiscated and that the firearm license of the owner of the weapon should be suspended for a period of five years or more. And we note that this would need to require some sort of amendment in terms of the Firearms Control Act to align its purposes and implementation. Finally, in closing, um, in relation to amendment of section 17 offenses, we reiterate that imposing harsher sentences have not proven to act as a deterrent to domestic violence or other forms of GBV in our country. And contrary, evidence has shown that the death penalty and life sentences do not prevent crime or minimize, minimize violence. And what we would rather advocate for is firstly a functional criminal justice system which successfully prosecutes um, offenses and calls for law enforcement and services to better provide services and serve the community. But secondly, that we look at you know a holistically um, more proactive measures to to look at how there is systems in place and services and programs in place to to address you know um, systemic causes of, of violence and address that from a more preventative measure thank you thank you very much uh, Ms. Leo. Um, I will now note members who would want to ask questions honorable I'm not sure whether you have raised your hand or you did not lower your hand. No, I've raised it again. Thank you, Chair. Also, oh, okay, you raised your hand. Okay. Honorable Horn, any other member would want to ask questions or make comments? Um, seemingly, it's Honorable Horn. Over to you, Honorable Hon, or Honorable Mumpuke, Honorable Maseko Jere, in that order. Honorable Hon. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is around the, the uh, submission in as far as it centers on the proposed toughening of the bail protocol, or the, the re really the proposal that no bail be granted. Um, I have taken note of the fact that the submission says that, uh, that the Sonke gender justice is not in support because of the effects of overcrowding and, as they call it, no scientific indication or evidence that, that this type of, of um, toughening bail protocol really acts as a deterrent. And, and at the outset, I must say, and, and it is on record, that we from our side, and I want their comment on that, that um, argument as well have questioned whether to to implement a, a blanket prohibition on on affording bail in 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 these circumstances would pa pass constitutional muster however having said that I, I i want to to make the statement that the issue of overcrowding cannot be a consideration of us in in dealing with the proposed amendment to the legislation because obviously we we must make uh, laws as if uh, DCS and uh, 
government as a whole is able to sufficiently manage overcrowding. Um, and then I also want their, their comments on the statement whether the fact that, that we are aware and it is well publicized of um, accused persons who appear before our courts and then are released on bail and then sometimes um, are again arrested for, for, for in, in, in relation to very, very serious crimes, whether uh, that specific uh, set of information ultimately do not work in contradiction to their, their argument that there's no indication that, that uh, tougher bail protocols are, are effective. And then lastly, I want to also on the issue of constitutionality of all of this, given their expertise, also want their comment um, on the statement that if bail protocols are to be toughened up, shouldn't one then rather consider a situation that if one has a record, uh, a criminal record at all, or if it is the information is available that you have previously uh, been charged or arrested in relation to, to uh, gender-based and se sexual violence, whether it wouldn't be prudent then to look into the issue of, of, of um, uh, as a matter of principle or law, denying uh, bail opportunity for such an accused. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mufuke. Thank you very much, Chairperson, and thanks to Sonke Justice. I just want to, I'm covered by Honorable Hon on the bail issue. Thank you very much, Honorable Hon. I want to check on the issue. I became interested when you are talking about the steel thing. And I was thinking about the other side of it. This one is when the condom, a person can remove the condom in the process. But there can be another way, a, a side of it where a condom goes into inside the woman because of the carelessness. What do you take that? Because it also poses the same risk. And you find that a person will know that later. And we have seen or heard about stories like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Masako Jala. Thank you, Chairperson. No, I just wanted to uh, welcome the, the, the presentation. And I've seen uh, some similarities with the previous one, but we, because I thought that maybe uh, there would be no one maybe would say something and then it, it will be like, we didn't hear. In fact, we, we heard everything that you said and we appreciate your input and we, we, we want to thank you very much. Your presentation. I don't have a comment as such. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, uh, Songke and uh, Sunt. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, and I hope I've captured all the questions correctly. And um, if not, then feel free to jump in. So, uh, Commissioner Horn, I think first and foremost, on, on your last point in relation to whether or not in cases where there, uh, in relation to, to bail, you know, hearings where there are formal records, criminal records, um, in relation to, to cases of uh, domestic violence or GBV, we, in, in those incidences, we fully support that um, the, the NPA would, would then oppose bail on the basis that um, there, are, there is a, a history or a pattern of violence. And I think in, in that case, it would be a matter of due process. So it's not an automatic prohibition of, of bail and that the, the individual would need to prove, uh, or, or the person that is applying for bail, that they would need to prove that um, it is interest of justice not to, to release them. Um, but I think the, the issue, uh, the argument around um, the accused persons on being released on bail um, overall. Uh, we, we do stand by it. We do think that the issue is that we need to take the approach that um, Section 35 does indicate that one is innocent until proven guilty um, and that 35.1F does have the right to bail. 
Um, and, and I do take your point about the, the issue of overcrowding. Um, so certainly one should examine whether or not, you know, it, it is helpful. And, and, and I, I do concede that, you know, we cannot heavily rely on just an, a merely overcrowding challenge. But I think we do need to ensure, and this was something I, I noted at the end, is that when you look at the entire criminal justice process, um, we're, we're looking um, towards developing a society that is violent free um, and that we want to address the issues of, of, of violence, GBV, domestic violence. It is crucial for us to look at it from a multi-pronged holistic approach. So when you're essentially um, finding conditions in, in, in prisons um, that are extremely violent and, and one may be um, placed in there because of the factor of overcrowding, you are you know, increasing the risk of, of, of violent behavior in, in those prisons. So what we are saying is that we're not completely opposed to people not being um, granted bail, but we are stating that it should be considered heavily within the, the existing constitutional framework, um, that it, it would be in the interest of justice to grant or deny bail. And then the second argument is that we do need to look at uh, systems that really um, revise our existing criminal justice system that looks at it in a way where we are giving adequate um, facilities that increase the chances of rehabilitation in the long run. Um, because we don't want to write off a society as a whole of, of incarcerated persons. Um, but, you know, taking into consideration certain individuals where they have a propensity for violence, we do not oppose that, you know, bail should not be granted in those cases. Um, Honorable Member Moffat King, um, you mentioned the issue of um, okay, so you, you acknowledged our, our suggestion about the issue of stealthing, but you also made a comment about an additional um, act where you, I think if I, if I have captured you correctly, um, you said the incident where people are engaged in uh, sexual relations and the, the condom slips off and, and what, what we see in that case. Um, look, with, with the, in, the definition of stealthing, um, there was an intent to deliberately remove the, the condom. And that's why we, we think that it is a form of domestic violence that should be included. But in, in certain cases where um, people may have been careless um, and you know that they didn't put a condom on correctly and it falls off, they, my, my in interpretation was there was no intention or, or malice behind it. So that would be a bit of a gray area and that would be difficult to include that um, within the, the DVA. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Leo, Ms. Leo. And thank you to the Gender, Songa Gender Center for the presentation. Uh, it will indeed assist us in our deliberations. Uh, honorable members, we, um, we have finished before time. I'm not sure whether we should take uh, another um, organization that is ready so that when we meet after the joint sitting, we don't sit until late. But if there is no other organization that is ready, maybe we would meet after the joint sitting. Um, first of all, do we want to proceed and meet any organization that is ready or do we want to wait and, um, and meet again after the joint sitting? Jefferson, I would suggest that I would suggest that uh, we adjourn for now so that we can be able to charge because we are going to be going to a sitting at three. Otherwise, okay. our budgets and all that, and be able to have lunch, a comfort break, and then we can join at six. That is my suggestion. Okay. Okay. I don't see any objections to that one. Um, honorable members, can we adjourn for lunch and uh, attend the joint sitting at start at three? Uh, we will meet again at six uh, to continue with our public hearings. We will be meeting three organizations uh, at six um, from six o'clock. It will be the International Women's Forum of South Africa. It will be the Commission of Gender Equality for Gender Equality. 
it will be action aid. These are the three organizations that we would meet today. That would, we would start at six until half past eight. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, members. Uh, the meeting is adjourned for now. Uh, committee secretary, are we going to use the same? Uh, when we come back, are we going to use the same link? Um, good day, Chair. We will send the link to this in shortly. Members will receive a link, a fresh link. Okay, so because this one was still was only sent okay. until two o'clock. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, members. Uh, can you adjourn? And thank you to all the presenters that have already presented. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Bye.